You're now listening to the Laravel Podcast. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Laravel Podcast. This is season six, back together with uh, a subset of the original crew. Me and Taylor are going to be uh, doing some podcasting here together. And if you are not watching us live, my name is Matt Stauffer. I am the CEO and co-founder of Titan. And uh, my other co-host to get with me is Taylor Otwell. Taylor, you want to say hi to the people? Hey, everybody. I'm Taylor Otwell, creator of Laravel. All right. So we right now we have a grab bag of topics we're going to be talking about. And the first thing that's coming up is an update on kind of what's been going on in the world of Laravel. So we've got all the announcements that happened at Laravel or Laracon. We've got everything that's coming with Laravel 11 and a few new tools that you kind of teased at Laracon India, but then you also made a little bit more formal and releases and stuff like that. So let's just get started with Folio, Volt, and whatever else is going on. Um, is Folio and Volt a good place to get started? And just kind of, because I know that they're sort of like a, they're a package on their own that's a little bit distinct from the other stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good place to get started. I mean, they're kind of the newest members of the Laravel ecosystem, so to speak. Yeah. So I know that um, while we talk about Livewire a lot, because Livewire is not like official, you know, first party Laravel stuff, not everybody fully understands Livewire. And I know in order to cover Folio and Volt, we'll have to talk about Livewire a bit. So let's real quick just cover what Livewire is. So it's a project by Caleb Porzio um, that is like, it's, it's like, first and a half party second party ish right it's like it's yeah we're sort of making it a we're trying to make it a more first party but it's one of the only first party packages that's not maintained by mm -hmm. laravel staff it's maintained by caleb yeah um and that was one of the announcements that you made at laracon right it was sort of you're like kind of bringing it on board even though it's still being maintained by caleb Right, and the same, and same also with Inertia JS, which was originally written by Jonathan Rennig. I think both of these packages have become sort of instrumental to the way people write front ends in Laravel. Um, I think if you're building an application that's fairly complicated and, and you want it to have kind of a modern feeling UI, it, that can be sort of hard to do using just plain Blade templates. So yeah. tools like Livewire, which is sort of an augmentation to Blade, supercharged version of Blade, um, yeah. and Inertia, which lets you pair up Vue or React or Svelte with the Laravel backend, have sort of become the two go-to tools, I think, for writing modern front ends in Laravel. Yeah, for sure. And so having both of those internal makes it even more sense that when you create a lot of the various, you know, Breeze or whatever else, it says, do you want to create this in Livewire or do you want to create this in Inertia? So now it makes a lot more sense for those to be kind of native Laravel things. Um, if somebody hasn't worked with an Inertia or Livewire, do you want to give a real quick intro to either of those? And I can, I can give intros too, but I figure if, you know, what's the 30 second intro to what uh, Inertia is or, or Livewire? Yeah, so Livewire is, um, you basically are still writing your front end in Blade, but you also pair it with a component on the back end, or I mean, a component class, let's say, mm -hmm. um, that looks a lot like kind of a view component where you can put methods on it and then you can attach those methods to like button clicks in your blade. Um, so you imagine a button HTML element in a blade template. It can have a wire colon click directive that specifies an action that should be called on the back end when that button is clicked. So that's very much like hooking up like a button click handler in JavaScript, except you're doing everything in pure PHP. Um, so you don't actually have to learn a new language, a new sort of ecosystem uh, to get started building applications that honestly feel very um, dynamic and and lively and, and have this very reactive interface, but you're not having to write any JavaScript to make it happen. And of course, there's JavaScript stuff happening behind the scenes, but um, you're able to leverage all of your PHP knowledge in building these really cool applications. Um, inertia is basically a way to pair a React or Vue front end with a Laravel back end in a way that doesn't just want to make you go crazy. Um, so let's imagine Inertia didn't exist for a second and you had a React or Vue front end and you wanted to pair it with Laravel. There would be like all these hoops you have to jump to to make that happen in terms of like, how are you going to do authentication? How are you going to maintain state within the application? How are they going to talk to each other? Are they going to be two separate repositories that are deployed separately. Yeah. And inertia is sort of an answer to those problems where your view or react 
front end lives like within your resources JS directory if you're a Laravel app and you don't do any client side routing. So you define all of your routing in your normal Laravel routes file, but instead of returning like a blade template, you return an inertia page and that corresponds to a view document, you know, in your resources JS directory and you pass data to it from your controller and that's proxied into the props of the react or the view component. Um, which is super nice because you can do all the database queries you need to do within the controller and pass them all to the view component or react component at once. And so you don't have all these like loading states in the yeah. view or react front end that you would typically have if you're writing sort of like a, a react or view SPA. Um, so inertia is like, I don't think of inertia as a framework in terms of a, an entirely new way to build UIs like I do LiveWire because mm. inertia is almost like this wire protocol between Laravel and Viewer React that lets them interchange data and yeah. tell each other how to navigate. But it's not really like this huge sprawling framework that takes over your whole application. You're still writing pretty typical view and React code. It's just the routing and data hydration is um, a little bit different. Yeah, and I, I want to speak really positively about both of those, and it makes sense that they're kind of taking the same space here. Both uh, LiveWire and Inertia allow you to write reactive, interactive front ends in a way that requires less extra code, less um, cruft in the way, less separation between your front and your back end than a traditional SPA. And for those who aren't familiar, an SPA is a single page app where you would have one Laravel API backend and one view or React uh, or whatever else front end that are entirely separate pieces of code. They're two separate code bases. They're, you know, you really have to manage them separately. And when you're doing something like that, you basically say, oh, well, we're gonna build this feature. What API endpoints do we need to serve it? And what uh, front end components do we need to do it? And your front end has to have also in routing, even though you're used to doing routing in Laravel. So inertia allows you to say, we will use the, you know, basically if you like to write your templates in JavaScript, you should use Inertia. And if you like to write your templates in Blade, you should use Livewire, unless you have some reason to use a, a full SPA. But it's kind of like giving you those the two angles of a much more conjoined um, form of front and back end development that is more reactive than plain Blade, but less separated than an SPA. So, okay. So if that's what uh, we're working with so far, what are Folio and Volt? So Folio and Volt are two new packages that exist mainly on the, the live wire side of the spectrum. Um, we'll start with Folio um, and then we'll go to Volt, although I think they work best when they're paired together. So Folio is um, a page-based routing package for Laravel. So basically what it means is you can install Folio and then you can drop a blade template in a resources slash pages directory or resources, resources slash views slash pages directory. And then you can just navigate to that page in your browser by going to the URI or the URL that matches the name of that page. So for example, if I drop like a, a hello.blade.php in my pages directory, I can go to myapp.com slash hello and that template is just rendered. And then it has all sorts of conventions um, and of course supports like nested pages, wildcard parameters, um, route model binding. So it lets you basically do a really powerful routing, honestly, just by dropping pages in this pages directory and all the routing is done for you. You don't have to define a route for each page. So it's a very fast sort of development feedback loop. Um, but I think on its own, it doesn't really shine until you pair it with something like Volt. And Volt is a way to write Livewire components in a single file. So, you know, earlier I said you write a Livewire component by having a blade template and then a class. And typically, historically in Livewire, those would be in two separate files. You'd have your Livewire component class in one file and your blade template that hooks up to that component in another file. Volt lets you put both of those things in the same file, which is very similar to how you you would define a reactor a view component where you have some script that has functions and behavior at the top and then your template and html and all that is down at the bottom it's the same way in volt you can define your livewire class at the top and you can do that using the traditional class-based livewire api or you can use a new functional api to define all of those actions state all of that and then put your template at the bottom and hook them up together um, the reason i think people like that approach to writing Livewire and View and React is 
basically revolves around this concept of co-locating behavior. So mm -hmm. things that change together kind of live together uh, in this approach to writing code. So a lot of times if you're changing, you know, the HTML and the click handlers in your template, you're also making a few changes to the component behavior on the back end, and you can just make those changes all in one file and you can kind of see everything together. So, hey, what actually happens when I click this button? What database queries are run and all of that? It's just all in the same file. So that is what Volt is. Um, Folio basically started out as an idea on a plane ride to Europe where I was riding to uh, Laracon, India, and I was like, you know, I've had this idea in my head for a few months, and I kind of had some notes about how I thought it would work, and I had this, you know, 24 hours of travel time in front of yeah. me. So I was like, I'm going to write Folio on the plane. I love and that. So uh, I wrote pretty much that whole package on the plane to Laracon, India. Um, Volt was, um, to give you a bit of background on that was, um, another idea I'd had in my head for many months, honestly, and I had talked to Caleb about it. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we could, you know, define these live wire components in the same file as the template, but we just couldn't really crack how to make it happen until, um, I actually got it to work, um, with the traditional like class-based API um, by extracting the, the component out, writing it to these separate cache files, writing the template by itself, and like everything kind of compiles down on the fly to traditional live wire stuff. Um, and then I showed that to Nuno uh, Maduro here at Laravel, and he was like, I think we could do like a functional API for this, and it would be really clean and, and nice. And I was like, hey, if you can make it happen, go for it. And he did. Right, He's yeah. kind of really good at figuring out, you know, very... Uh, science experiment type projects and yeah. making them work that's awesome yeah so if i think about folio one of the things that reminds me a lot of is um working with cmss and static site generators and stuff like that where you are simplifying the process of adding a piece of content down to the point where it doesn't quite require the same level of work from a um from a like hooking into the actual framework perspective. So you don't have to go into the routes file. Mm -hmm. You know, I even imagine some front end programmers being given access to the repo and saying, hey, here's where all the content goes and just throw blade files in here. And if you want some interactivity, let us know, build the page with a placeholder where the interactivity is gonna go. And then we'll go in there and we'll throw some Volt content there. So it's really cool to be able to understand that this is to me opening up the opportunity of how do you make defining routes, defining content, defining pages more accessible to more people on the team. Um, Volt obviously right. gives us a really nice syntax for this all-in-one, you know, putting, like you said, co-locating, all this kind of stuff, which is very nice. Um, have you found, um, and I don't know if people have kind of given you much feedback, because when I originally saw Volt, it was sort of like presented with the functional aspect as a big aspect of it. I personally, I think I'm more comfortable with the traditional class-based version, which is just kind of, I think I just tend to think in PHP classes a little bit more. I love the co-location. Have you been finding that people are latching a little bit more onto the class base versus the functional, or is it not really well defined at this point? Um, I don't have any hard data, but I know people were very excited when we introduced the class based syntax. I mean, it's kind of funny. Like I said, I said I wrote the class based syntax originally, which I did, and that's how Vault worked actually when I demoed it in Lar at Laracon India. Uh, and then we came back and wrote the functional API. And when we wrote the functional API, um, we were like, well, we'll just remove the class API because the functional API felt, felt like really good. And so when we put out Vault at Laracon US, by that mm -hmm. time, the class API had actually been removed. Um, and we just had the functional API. And then we came back later, people were like, you know, I'm not sure about the functional API. I already know the class API. And Caleb actually also wanted us to try really? to bring back in the class API, like kind of at his request. Got and it. so I talked to Nuno, I was like, hey, we could actually just bring this class API back really easy behind the scenes. And why don't we just do it? Cause it's not that much code. Yeah. So we actually brought that back post release. And I think it is actually, you know, really popular and people were really okay. excited about that. So it, it may be in fact, the most popular way to use okay. Vault. I know that Nuno, um, working with Pest, has kind of like gotten a lot of functional things, and so it's weird because mm -hmm. as an old head PHP person, I feel like I should be comfortable with them, but also as someone who's gone from like you know functions to classes, for some reason, just I still find myself more comfortable usually when things are in a more class shape. So, yeah. Um, so what else is going on in Laravel 11 that's exciting? I know there's a lot of like kind of behind the scene changes or not even necessarily behind the scenes, but things in terms of like the directory structure and stuff. And you can share mm -hmm. some of that if you want, but are there any other things, whether they're overarching or individual features that are really kind of exciting for you that you want to share? 
Um, well, we've got a new pack. We've got a couple new packages um, in the works, but for Laravel 11, um, I think Folio and Vault and Laravel 11 are all part of sort of the same push to simplify Laravel mm. in a way. And I think um, some backstory on this is like, uh, what earlier this year, basically, I opened up Laravel kind of with fresh eyes mm -hmm. and was sort of reminded how many like folders and yes. files and concepts are in Laravel um, that all of us that have been using it for 10 plus years now sort of take for granted and understand and just like, Oh, of course it's this way. Like what other way would it possibly be? You know? Yeah. Um, and I tried to come at it with fresh eyes and really wanted to streamline the whole thing for Laravel 11, mainly like you said at the application skeleton layer, not really even changing that much at the framework behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, actually I haven't changed much at all. There's no breaking changes at all actually during this wow. whole process. Um, so like some things that I've done is eliminate a lot of the service providers that were in the skeleton and just get down to one service provider. And honestly, even that is optional. And I really, toyed around with just not having any service providers at all hmm. by default in the Laravel 11 skeleton. Wow. Um, so you, when you open the app directory, you would basically just have a models directory if, yeah. if we went that route. Um, I haven't pulled the trigger on that mainly because there's so much learning material out there in the wild that sort of assumes you have an app service provider mm -hmm. to sort of drop things into, you know, right. screencasts, blog posts, like, hey, just put this line of code in your app service provider and then this works. Yeah. And I think removing the app service provider in Laravel 11 and then sort of invalidating all of that learning and mm -hmm. educational material that's been put out there thus far is sort of a big step that I'm not sure I'm really ready to take. But anyway, um, yeah, so streamlining service providers, um, there's actually no middleware in the Laravel 11 skeleton by default until you mm -hmm. just like make your own using the make middleware command. Um, the migrations have been simplified. Uh, what else? The The way the default user model looks has been simplified. The way error handling works has really? been simplified okay. um even so a lot of stuff has been kind of pushed into this one bootstrap app file where you can manipulate middleware you can configure exception handling you can do all sorts of stuff within this one file that used to take place in like 10 different files it felt like yeah um so yeah, it's all sort of the same push to sort of when a new person opens a Laravel 11 application we have much less files in front of your face to overwhelm you uh, much it. fewer concepts um, and folio and vault are just part of that you know um, writing live wire components in one file page-based routing and not having to bother with routes when you need it um, it's all part of the same push to sort of streamline laravel make it more approachable make it more accessible not have 10 different ways to do the same thing you yeah. know stuff like that and I assume that because not a lot has changed kind of behind the scenes, you can still do all the old things you used to do. It's just you have to opt into them. Like there, you could still have an API yeah. routes file. You just have to publish it. You can still have service providers. Mm -hmm. You just have to create them. Whereas in old Laravel, it's like anything you might want to do, it's already there for you to edit. In Laravel 11, it's going to be like anything you want to do, you can put there to edit. By default, it's going to be simpler for the people who don't know what to put where, basically. Right. Yeah. And we basically introduced um, some new command. I mean, another thing I forgot to mention is there's no config files by default. In Laravel yeah, 11. I saw that. So That's amazing. Um, yeah. So there's but what we did is actually introduce some new artisan commands. So like um, there's a config publish artisan command where it will prompt you for what config file you want to publish. And then we made a slight change to how configuration works to where you actually only need to define the options that you're actually changing. So mm. if you're just going to use the default value, you can just remove all that extra noise from the config file and the framework will just cascade back to the default values for okay. you. We also added a lot more environment variables to the dot env file so that you, um, don't need to go into the config files as much because you can just change it from your environment configuration. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then also if you want to get all the config files, you can just run artisan config publish with no additional arguments and all the config files that are traditionally in Laravel applications will just be put in your application and you can continue 
as normal as if nothing changed. Um, we also added a couple new commands and we're prefixing them with install. So instead of like make controller, there's install API, install broadcasting. Mm-hmm. And you can think of the difference between the two as like a make command kind of makes one file, whereas an install command does a variety of things to like prep your application for this new feature. So install API installs Laravel Synctum. It creates the routes API file. It maybe adds a middleware. You know, it's doing a variety of things, not just making one file. So I think we can actually um, add a few more of those as we keep working on Laravel 11. But yeah, making stuff more opt-in that used to be there by default is sort of the general theme. That's awesome. And it's interesting because I I remember being on a podcast a while back with a couple of JavaScript programmers who were like, look, I've heard about Laravel. Talk to me about it. I tried to install it, and I was really overwhelmed because there were so many freaking files. And I was like, yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Compared to an Express thing where you've got server.js and you know db.js or something like that, we've got hundreds out of the box. And part of that is just because we have a lot more features out of the box than Express does. But I really like what you're saying is like, those of us who know that we want broadcasting can type in artisan install broadcasting, but the vast majority of Laravel apps don't use broadcasting. You know, a large percentage right. of Laravel apps don't ever use route slash API.php or make any, I mean, the vast majority of my Laravel apps have no custom config whatsoever other than adding maybe one um, block into the services, you know, to add some mm-hmm. third party service and that's it. So it makes yeah. a ton of sense. And honestly, it'll be a lot easier to know like what's unique about this app when the only things you see in that config directory are the ones that have actually been customized for this project versus the same 10 files that, that every project has. So, Right. And and Laravel Herd is sort of part of the story as well, which we haven't mentioned. It didn't have in our show. Yeah, we should notes, talk but, about that. Yeah. You know, making, um, making it easier to get started with Laravel has been sort of the, my general theme lately. Mm-hmm. Um, so Herd is basically, for those that don't know, is an app revealed at Laracon. It's a Mac OS app, although we would obviously love to bring windows support to this at some point where you install it on your mac and you're ready to go it has laravel valet kind of embedded within it it has php embedded within it it does not use homebrew or any other package managers that sort of put a lot of other stuff on your system it has composer it has the laravel installer Um, and so basically you install herd on a brand new macbook and you can create a new laravel project immediately without installing any other tools at all um so the way I demoed that at Laracon was actually not having PHP on my laptop at all when I took the stage to do my Laracon demo. And at the beginning of my talk, basically we installed Herd and demonstrated how easy it is at this point to get started with PHP um, and Laravel. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's part of sort of this whole push to streamline everything about yeah. Laravel, getting started with Laravel, what it looks like, um, and make it generally less overwhelming for you know a new generation of laravel developers which which maybe ties into what some of the other things we want to talk about as far as phe's place in the language ecosystem yeah and herd is great so for those who don't know sail came out a couple years ago as sort of like the way that anybody who wants to use laravel across any different um, environment as long as you're willing to install docker you can get sail and sail kind of gets you up and running which is wonderful and We've actually used Sail not just for beginners, but often there's a few people at Titan who use Sail for every project, and they do just a few tweaks to it. Um, but Sail requires Docker. And so there's something mm-hmm. great about that, but there's something always been great about Valet, about its <coughs> ability to say, it just, just installs it in your local machine. But the biggest downside of Valet is Homebrew. And as the maintainer of Valet, I'd say the most difficult part of running Valet is Homebrew. And so what uh, happened with, with Herd behind the scenes was it's currently running on a fork of Valet, and Marcel and I are working on taking that fork and merging it back together with the mainline Valet so that any feature that Herd or Valet users get, they share. The only difference is Valet is calling out to basically a, a, a homebrew manager, whereas Herd's going to be calling out to a manager that handles its own internal dependencies. So a lot of people were saying, you know, Matt, I haven't switched to Herd. I'm loyal. And I'm like, first of all, use what works for you. But second of all, they're both Valet, right? Like Herd is Valet yeah. on top of its own dependencies. CLI Valet is Valet on top of homebrew. Either way, it's Valet. So we're, we're all family yeah. here. Um, go ahead. Yeah, and sa- Sale... I, I agree. Sale is good for people that are willing to install Docker. And it, it is useful in the sense that it provides a um, a way to get Laravel up and running across basically every operating yeah. system. However, when you compare it to like modern, other modern, let's say JavaScript frameworks, it's so much more 
um, setup and sort of baggage and, and slowness that comes with installing Docker, downloading the images, building the images, and it makes the whole story feel very complicated. Yeah. Uh, which is why I mean, it used to be in the Laravel docs earlier this year. Um, or maybe late last year, the way you got started with Laravel, the default way it showed you was Laravel sale. And I just like, I went out there and saw that with fresh eyes. And I was like, wait a second, like let's make the default installation story, just artists and serve, um, to get started with your first Laravel project, you know, like that's so much faster and, and so much leaner. Um, why dump Docker on the first thing people come or see when they come to start a new Laravel project shouldn't be like all this Docker stuff. Yes. Um, it makes Love Laravel that. feel really complicated. Um, and now it's still artisan serve, but we have a little call out of course for, uh, for Laravel herd. Okay. I haven't looked at the docs lately, but is it currently recommending the Laravel installer or just using composer create project? Uh, I think it's just composer create project actually. Yeah, less um, dependencies that way. I love yeah, the installer, like, <laughs> but I get it, you know. Let's see, your first Laravel project, yeah, composer create uh-huh. project. Uh and then it says or you can do the Laravel installer and then or you can change into your app directory, run PHP artisan serve, done. Hit it in your love browser. It. Love it. Very cool. Okay. So that was Laravel 11. We, we talked through her a little bit. Is there anything else about Laravel 11 that you want to talk about before we move on to our next topic? Um, just that, you know, if you hear about all these changes, don't be too scared because you can take your Laravel 10 app and actually update it to Laravel 11 and not change anything about your app. Uh, okay. There's no breaking changes in the framework itself. Um, we've mainly been focused on the skeleton and making that simpler, more streamlined, um, stuff like that. And, and we have uh, a couple new packages. So if all this skeleton stuff is sort of really boring to you, um, I think there's still going to be some good stuff in Laravel 11's sort of overall release cycle. That will be exciting mm-hmm. with a couple of these new packages we've been working on. Uh, one is Laravel Pulse, uh, which we'll probably have more details about later this fall. And another one we've been hacking on is called Laravel Reverb, which I hope to also kind of get out this fall as well. Awesome. Um, so we have talked about this a tiny bit, but let's let's dig a little bit further into PHP's place in the language ecosystem, and, and maybe we'll kind of call that it uh, the, the end for today. Uh, there's been a lot of talk lately from folks in the JavaScript world who have started seeing kind of everything we got out of the box with Laravel. I know that Aaron Francis has kind of gotten some connections there, and he made a video, and a couple other folks have made videos of, um, you know, basically saying, dear dear JavaScript world, dear non-Laravel world, here's what comes out of the box with Laravel that have been getting people really excited. Um, but the interesting thing is there's PHP's place in the language ecosystem and Laravel's place in the, the app making ecosystem. And those aren't exactly the same conversation, right? We right, yeah. often come back to this topic about like the relationship between Laravel and PHP and all that kind of stuff. And, and one of the things that I've seen lately is that there's another round of people trying to help PHP itself be a little bit more of a comfortable place. You've got Tim McDonald working on trying to do an updated version of the PHP documentation site. Um, you've got Aaron Francis trying to expose people not just to Laravel, but to PHP in general. And then you've also got, I think it's Brent who's working on the um, the RFC vote site, um, where basically it's saying, we don't just want the people who are officially a part of PHP internals to weigh in on their thoughts on these RFCs. We also want the broader community to do so. All moving in, hopefully, a better direction of a, a more open and sharing kind of PHP world. How are you thinking today about both PHP as it relates to Laravel and the rest of the world, and then also about Laravel as it relates to kind of the rest of the ecosystem? Do you have any kind of thoughts there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think about it a lot. Um, so I, I think there's kind of like two ways people approach this. Um, one is sort of this camp that is like, ph we can make php really cool again um yes and i'm not sure i I totally identify with that camp i i'm not sure that can actually be done but yeah i i don't i'm not uh i don't want to be too pessimistic i think we should make laravel or or php as good as it can be Mm -hmm. and try to make it as approachable as it can be and not worry so much about like uh, making it cool or like yes. hyped. Um, yes. I don't, I don't really think, I think that's, that's gonna achievable. <laughs> I, I honestly think like once a tech, um, is sort of new and fresh and goes through its initial hype cycle, you can't really go back to that. You know, there's yeah. no, y- you need to move on to other things in terms of like being mature, being stable, not breaking things, adding nice new features and sort of getting into a more sustainable groove of improvement yeah. mm-hmm. and not really chasing like the hype cycle. 
Now, I do see Laravel and PHP as sort of like, PHP is sort of an implementation detail of yes. Laravel, this app de development ecosystem and framework. Um, yep. Laravel is a framework that has a lot of features and a lot of tools, and it happens to be written in PHP. Um, but I, you know, I think when people are coming to PHP, Laravel is sort of the obvious choice these days for a full stack framework that is really productive and easy to use. Yep. And uh, I see my job as stewarding that, curating that, making Laravel the best it can be. Um, and I don't think too much about like, I, I, I don't know, I don't know the right way to phrase it, but like being cool or being hype, yep. you know, I just am doing a service and making Laravel as productive and enjoyable as I can. And that's, and the chips just fall where they do, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was kind of a few weeks there, like a month or two ago where I guess people were sort of frustrated with maybe some next JS, um, app router or whatever it's called and yeah. it's like is php cool again everyone's treating <laughs> tweeting about php these sort of youtubers yep. um like it, which this is another weird thing like when we first were writing laravel 10 years ago i don't remember there being like these tech uh yeah. like streamers that are like yeah. celebrities almost yes in the ecosystem which feels very different but they were yeah. they were talking about laravel a little bit um and not to put them down because i know they're they're real programmers in a yeah. very real sense but they're like sort of also these sort of tv celebrities of, of yes. programming now yep. um anyway so yeah that's how i think about laravel i'm curious what you think about php and can it be cool again? Is it cool now? Uh, what, yeah. you know, I, I don't it's, know. I, I, I agree with you a lot. I actually, two, three years ago, for those who don't know, maybe five plus years ago, we were really doing a lot of work to try and bridge gaps between the, the old school PHP community and the Laravel community. So I built a lot of relationships there and went to conferences and spoke at conferences and got to meet people. And I just was really hopeful about us kind of building a very positive and productive working, productive working relationship. And not to say that there aren't friendships and connections there, but I've just discovered that the goals of the PHP organization and the people who have voting rights for PHP are not always super well aligned with Laravel's, and that's just kind of, that's the way it is right now. Um, and I don't want to kind of talk trash, but I've just found those efforts to be not super well placed at this point. I had made websites at one point, omgphp.com and yphp.com, and I was trying to share, like, here's why you should consider PHP today, and oh my gosh, PHP is really new and exciting and cool, and it was all about that, like, trying to hype PHP, and I just got tired of it, like, in part because of what you said, which is there's no real way to hype something that's been around for a while, even if it's great. Like, Ruby is great, but mm -hmm. Ruby is not the new hotness. People are not getting excited yeah. about Ruby. That doesn't make Ruby a bad language, right? And so, but the second thing is, uh, we don't have, and I, I, I'm sorry if this sounds fatalistic to folks, and I hope that it doesn't end up like this, but just from my very personal perspective, we don't have the amount of influence on PHP, the language, that I think makes effort put in that direction feel worth it, you know? So every right. time I've tried to put a lot of energy, effort, money, or whatever else to say, let's have multi-line short closures, or let's, you know, allow what, whatever it ends up being, anything where I'm trying to put time and energy towards kind of shifting PHP itself, I just get a little frustrated and I get a little overwhelmed. And I understand that if I was willing to commit my life to being a contributor to PHP and learning C and all this kind of stuff, I could be more involved. I'm just like, I don't have time for that. I'm not that interested in PHP. So what I end up doing then is just saying, well, what does it look like to try and make it easy for people to learn PHP? How can I avoid any, you know, like if there's any prominent things that I think are really negative, how can I be a voice of trying to make those not be as prominent, you know, and how can we do that? And honestly, I think those things have happened. I think that the the PHP community, as it were, um, is much more represented by Laravel and WordPress and Symfony and, you know, these folks who are trying to build real things than it was 10 years ago. And I don't think it's nearly as many people out there being, you know, there's just all these little frameworks that were basically mm -hmm. crapping on Laravel all the time and weren't, weren't actually doing anything. And I kind of think a lot of that stuff has just shown that it's not super productive. There's not a lot of actual value being contributed by those. And so we have kind of weaned down to the people who are talking about PHP tend more to be the people who are actually building things. So even if they're not right. in the Laravel community, at least things are actually happening. So all that said, I'm a little I'm a little jaded, and I try to be really positive. Um, I don't think PHP is ever going to be hot, but I think that PHP can be increasingly easy, welcoming, 
um, you know, like enjoyable in certain moments where, you know, like, like, like I mentioned with the multi-line short closers, there are changes we can make to the core language that hopefully we can be all part of happening that make it more easy to work with. There's changes we can make to the, it's online representation, like Tim McDonald working in the docs that hopefully makes it easier for people to use. And it doesn't make it feel like it's 20 years old, you know, they're, I guess 30 mm-hmm. years old. Cause I think the nineties, when I look at the PHP website, <laughs> um, there's things we can do to make PHP easier to join, easier to learn all that kind of stuff. And I think that's a, that's our time better spent than trying to convince the core team to implement multi-line short closures or whatever else. So, yeah, I mean, I think it just comes down to focusing on what you can control, you know, yes, like, exactly. you sort of can't control the, the hotness of PHP. And I agree totally with what you said about like Ruby, C sharp, Java. These are all hugely popular languages in the real world in terms yes. of real businesses. I mean, I don't know how much Java is being written today. A ton is being written right now as we speak yes. of Java is being written around the world, but no one's talking about it on Twitter. You know what I mean? Like yep. the different, there's a difference between sort of the Twitter hype cycle and mm-hmm. real world and PHP, Ruby, Java, C sharp. None of these things are necessarily the darling of the Twitter sphere right now. Yes. Yeah. Um, but they are extremely relevant in real worlds on the ground coding business coding still um yes. and so what we can control i think is making laravel as good as it can be and php as good as it can be that's with within our power to do like you yeah. said um and that what else can we do you know like we're, yeah. we're trying to make the most productive web development ecosystem in the world i think and we're going to try to do that and if people enjoy it great um yeah, you know, and so be yes. it. You know, I don't know. Yeah. No, I I love that, and I I appreciate you focusing on that part because I don't want to like focus on my jaded part. Like, if I look at PHP, there's so many things I love about PHP that we are using in Laravel, right? Like the the aspects mm-hmm. of PHP. I love hosting a PHP site, man. I love writing a quick CLI tool in PHP. I love the ways that we have such limited memory usage and we don't have to deal with garbage collection with these ongoing things in the way that Ruby does. Like there's so many aspects of PHP and writing in PHP on a day-to-day basis that I think that Laravel, like PHP is an implementation implementation detail of Laravel, but it also takes advantage of the things that PHP uniquely has to offer in a way that I think is right. very cool and sexy. It's just not new. So it's not going to be on mm-hmm. a hype train. Um, each of those languages that you mentioned have something very unique to offer. And, and one thing is like as a consultant, Titan comes in all the time to people who are making millions of dollars and running their entire business on Laravel and PHP. And they're not even using the latest hotness in Laravel most of the time. The very, very, right. very few of them are using our latest and greatest. And, you know, if we're talking about like, oh, well, Bun's the greatest and everybody should be using bun well huge amounts of these people who we're dealing with are still using laravel elixir or they're still using yeah. grunt, grunt and gulp you know what i mean and they're making yeah. money and they're producing things and they're shipping stuff right so yeah the, the the hotness train the hotness cycle is is fun but it's if the point of all this is to ship is to run businesses is to make people's dreams possible you got to recognize that what's new and great and hot and exciting is not actually what defines that it is what can people actually build with a thing and so you can build with yeah. php you can build with laravel you can build with out of date laravel you can build with out of date php you don't need even our latest and greatest let alone whatever the internet twitter bubble latest and greatest concept is right i mean at the end of the day we're all pushing code to a rails app you know what i mean like <laughs> fair <laughs> i mean every line of code written today is getting pushed to github basically and yeah um so yeah but <laughs> i wonder what uh gitlab and bitbucket are written in but i'm sure it's not something new and hot and sexy so yeah i'm not sure yeah um well i know that we have a million other tops to talk about but i'm trying to help us keep it under 45 minutes for this season so i think we're kind of coming up on that one is there is there anything else ne- you wanted ne- to talk next about next episode today? will Next episode will have to be our spice episode. I feel yes, like we didn't exactly. get to the spicier topics today. I mean, we could we could hit we could hit final before we wrap up today. You wanna you wanna? Uh, how long have we been going? What are, what are we? 30, at? Thirty-eight minutes uh, on the call so far. Uh, I mean, sure, we can talk about final and types for a few minutes. Uh, that's okay. part of kind of the most recent Twitter drama, right? Was around TypeScript and uh, yeah. DHH removed. Um, TypeScript from one of their turbo related libraries, yep. I guess. And there was sort of 
a, a chain reaction of drama um, around that. But, but the only reason I kind of wanted to touch on this is I think people actually misunderstand my own view of types mm. and final in Laravel. Um, and they think I'm very anti-type. So, um, so like in Laravel 10, we recently added uh, types and mm -hmm. return types to all method definitions in the skeleton. And we may come back and do that for properties as well. The only reason we didn't do it in Laravel 10 is um, it was a breaking change, break change uh, yeah. whereas with, with methods it wasn't. Um, so like I've always been of the opinion that in your own application level code, types, great. Like you can use types as much as you want, final classes as much as you want. Yep. I've just been bitten so many times by using types internally in our framework code, mainly because of our release cycle. So for example, if we add a new method to the caching layer in Laravel and we type in something as a string, for example, and then we come back later and be like, Oh, it'd be really nice to also accept like a date time object as well here. We can't do that for another mm -hmm. year. You know yeah. what I mean? So yep. it's honestly like safer for us just to not type yeah. The, the argument and just to put it in the doc block, um, which I guess is similar to like JS doc where they, they're mm -hmm. putting the types in basically doc block things instead of in the code. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know. There's always been this sort of sentiment that I think Taylor is anti-type and that's just so not true in my own code. I app level code. I would use types all day. Final classes, possibly still a little stupid but <laughs> it's fine i'm not too <laughs> mad about it <laughs> um, oh, but in open source code it's so it's so yes. bad to come across a final class and you just can't extend it and uh whatever yeah i mean i couldn't agree with you more and i, I, will, I will get to the, the i think the rest of the spice next time but i did want to make sure we talked about this final class in part and i'm glad you brought it up because personally i think that final classes are unnecessary and kind of stupid but again like if i come across from the code base if we hit a moment where we got to change it the code base we just delete the word final it's not a big deal final classes yeah. and open source packages on the other hand have been consistently pains in my butt and the butts of many of my friends as we're trying to extend something in a way that the original author didn't imagine or decided was not the appropriate way to use it and now I have to basically like completely rewrite your entire set of code because you got excited about some blog post about final without realizing the actual practical implementation details. Yeah. And I think, you know, in your own app level code, it's basically documentation, right? It's like, hey, we're marking this final because if you want to extend it in the future, at the very least, it should like raise a question of, hey, yes. why do I want to extend this? And maybe ask like one of your teammates. Yeah. Uh, but of course, you could always remove it. Um, in open source code, you know, I think the rebuttal people always give, and we, we ran across this final class problem actually very recently where a, a symphony class was marked as final and we needed to override some behavior. And usually the rebuttal from not necessarily symphony maintainers, because I think they're very agreeable and understanding typically to yeah. work with. So I don't want to put them down. But in other libraries, sometimes you will see people mark things as final and be like, well, I don't want to deal with issues of people like overriding the method and then something breaking. And then they come take my time and issues. And like as an open source maintainer of a very large project, it just hasn't been my experience that that's actually creating a lot of overhead. You know, yeah. if someone raises a GitHub issue where like, Hey, I was overriding this protected method and the behavior change. So now my protected method is broken. Just be like, yep. Uh, we never advertised that behavior closed, yeah. but I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. Like it's, it's not that much of a time sink in my experience, yeah. but I love that. I saw someone wrote a composer plugin to actually go through your vendor directory and remove all final class <laughs> Uh, from like on composer install basically uh -huh. so every time your code updates all the final class declarations are just removed wow um, so <laughs> that's hilarious uh, like, yeah i think it was one of the laravel ecosystem people but uh that's so funny anyway yeah well and i mean this whole conversation about like it's useful for documentation reminds me a lot of when we first talked about type hinting again i don't know 10 years ago and i know that adam was very anti-type hinting for a long time not because he was anti the whole thing, but because type hinting in PHP was so non-nuanced that by yeah. choosing to use type hinting, you were unnecessarily constraining yourself from being able to, like for example, he would say all the time, somebody type hinted this in array, well, what if I wanna pass in a collection that has those same methods available? I can't do it because you type hinted array. I've found yeah. that um, there's two changes to that that have really helped me um, really warm up a lot. One of them is that types are much more nuanced in PH later versions of PHP. You know, we can yeah. now do union types, union all this kind of types, stuff. Yeah. yeah. 
And, and second of all, I've also just recognized that I think people are chilling out a little bit more. Like I do put a lot of return types and I put a lot of type hinting in my code because I treat it more like documentation. I, I recognize that the primary goal of this is not arguing that I'm trying to protect people from themselves, which is what it was often the early argument, but I'm like, hey, if I document it in line here, then I don't have to write a doc block that I might accidentally like get out of right. date or there's not no documentation. So as we see these things as more means of communicating with other programmers and less ways of protecting people from themselves or protecting us from other people, I think they become more and more helpful. But as long as, long as we're trying to use them to control or because it's like the thing you absolutely must do, that's where I'm like, y'all, let's chill out a little bit, you know? Yeah, I, th I think some people are uh, semi superstitious about types. And if I add all these types, m my code is actually functionally and behaviorally mm -hmm. correct, which are two different things. Uh, I do agree, like union types were actually super key in making PHP's type system sort of feel good and yeah. more complete. Yeah. Because um, it unlocks so much more possibilities. Yeah. Um, all right, so I think we're going to keep the rest of the spice for ne next episode, so y'all are just going to have to tune in for that one. Taylor, is there anything else you want to cover today before we wrap up? Not really. It's good to be back. It's good to be back no on kidding, the NFL podcast. I love this. <laughs> Thanks for joining me again, man. It's great to have a co-host again. Y'all uh, y'all getting... It's. I, I've been enjoying the... I'm trying to remember exactly your phrase, but... Welcome back. This is Taylor back in the studio. <laughs> it's good to have you back here, man. So. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks. Well, um, thank you so much for tuning into the first episode of Season 6 of the Laravel Podcast. We'll see you next time for a little bit more spice and uh, some more updates. Mm -hmm.